you know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason that the event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Ferrier Podcast, where I will sit down and converse with the superstars, the overachievers, the masters of our craft. Each episode will be a deep dive into their personal philosophies, their habits, the tools they use, and the secrets to not only their success, but overcoming failure as well. First, find somebody you can mimic, then find somebody you can stand, and then try to focus on one style until you master that style. So if you say, I can't do something, well, you're absolutely right. But if you say you're going to, you're absolutely right with that too. People say that you shouldn't define yourself by your work. That is not true. You know what Dave Farley does when he's, you know, lucky enough to be at the World Equestrian Games? I'm watching other people work. Yeah. I don't think uh, we do that enough. This podcast is for all of you out there who share my passion for the job and the desire to always improve. These interviews will put you in touch with the inner workings of the role models we all want to emulate. So let's get to it. You know, there's only so many hours in a day, and it's a matter of what you do with them. Welcome to the Mullins Farrier Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Jonathan Nunn, FWCF. I first met Jonathan back in 2018 when he was the main clinician for the Ontario Farriers Convention that year. I was immediately impressed by his humble and approachable nature. We all were. He shared with us a ton of his wisdom and knowledge that weekend, and we all went home with new tools on our belts. Later, I approached Jonathan about doing an interview for the podcast, and he graciously agreed. Our plan was to do it in person, but it just didn't work out that we could be in the same place at the same time whenever he came across the pond. So... We decided to go the remote route. I sent him a microphone, and through the magic of the interweb, we were able to have a conversation sitting comfortably both in our own homes. Before I continue on, I should read you his bio in his own words. With over 34 years of farriery experience, Jonathan Nunn FWCF is based in Staffordshire, England, and has a multi-farrier practice covering all aspects of farriery. John personally specializes in veterinary remedial work and performance horses nowadays. After many successful years in competitive farriery in the UK and internationally, John's simple, practical approach to horseshoeing is what he believes is key to maintaining soundness and good balance in the horses he trims and shoes. John attained his fellowship of the Worshipful Company of Farriers in 2017. As an examiner for the Worshipful Company, John is ever aware for the need to educate through sharing knowledge and techniques and is very much involved in educational events. He also regularly tutors those wishing to attain higher farriery examinations. John was a late starter in the competition circuits as family life was a priority for him whilst his three children were younger, and he didn't start to compete again until he was aged 39. Although through this time, He always remained active in farriery education and competition organizing. He met one of his mentors and friends, Grant Moon, who lived nearby, and they forged and competed together at many national and international contests, including the Calgary Stampede, where he won Rookie of 2010, Potluck Forging in 2011, and first place in the World Four-Man Draft Team in 2013, and achieved top five in the world championship also that year. From these practical experiences in competition, the learning curve was steep and fast, and John had seized every opportunity to compete and further his knowledge of farriery. He now travels as a clinician in representing Workman Hoof Care and is involved in his own farrier tool-making products with his son, Josh Nunn. Jonathan is the co-founder and chairman of the Farriers Foundation, which is a registered charity which supports farriers and their families that have been injured or become ill and require financial help. John and his wife Sarah run the charity from home with the help of five further trustees and run many events to support the charity, which relies on donations and farrier fundraising activities. Well, I have waited for months for this conversation to happen, and as you will hear, it was totally worth the wait. Please enjoy. I'm sitting here today with Jonathan Nunn. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for doing this. 
Hi, Brian. This is our second time attempting an interview not sitting in front of the person. So we had a few technical glitches and got them all sorted out. And here we go. At what point in your life did you get involved with horses? I've grown up with horses from an early age. My family had horses and ponies and uh, mom and dad were both keen on driving. So I, I grew up as a kid riding and driving and having fun with horses and ponies of my own. And, and then when I was 15 and wondering what direction to go in at school and I thought, hey, well, I like working with horses. So I went down that route and worked on, worked in stable yard to begin with. When I left school, I was 17, worked in a local yard. I couldn't really see the future in that for me. It didn't suit me. I didn't want to be an instructor. or, And then I, I left kind of not knowing what direction then to go in. And um, the guy that used to shoe my mum and dad's horses and ponies, David Udall, he's a Staffordshire farrier. We've always lived in Staffordshire. And I asked Dave if he would uh, think about taking me on as an apprentice. And uh, he took a bit of persuading and I had to prove myself. That's when the... Uh, when my story began, when um, Dave eventually offered me an apprenticeship and went from there. Oh, cool. Happy ever after. <laughs> <laughs> so how old would you have been then? 17 at that point? I was 18 when I started with Dave, just 18. And um, oh, okay. it took him a few months to get the apprenticeship sorted because he wasn't a training farrier, so he had to get his approval for training. And I was his only apprentice. He didn't train anyone else after me. I put him oh, off, really? I think. <laughs> 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 I doubt that. Too many questions. <laughs> no, he, did, he had a couple of guys started after me, but um, then he decided to go his own way. Right. He was a good guy, you know. He taught me a lot. His standard was top, and it still is now. He's in his 60s, he's still shoeing. I still see him, you know, in the Staffordshire Farriers Association. He's still a big part of that as well. Oh, incredible. It's nice to get on with your old bosses. And when, when you leave, it's nice to still get along, you know. For sure, because that doesn't always happen. No, no. Especially working in in a, the same area, I'm sure, too. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we, we're quite close. We're only five or six miles away, you know, but we never we never cross paths um, in that way. You know, I'll always communicate with him if there's clients that ring me that, that you know, for any reason. So, yeah, we've always we've always been that way. Staffordshire's quite good like that. Farriers are quite communicative in this area at the moment. Oh, okay. And the relationship with vets is good too? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely improving. And there's some big, big vet practices now, big hospitals. So depending on geographically where you're situated, some farriers are in the middle of, you know, four or five big hospital practice areas, you know, so... um, it has to be good. The communication side of it is something that I I work on a lot, and I try and um, I try and promote that in my business and and the guys that work with me. You know, well, I've got a vet that works for me actually. Oh wow! Okay, uh, vet farrier Jamie Marco Garcia. He's just completed a year with me, and he's going to take his diploma next April. So he's from Spain. Oh, cool! Now, how many people do you have working with you? Uh, there's myself and my son Josh. Uh, he's, he did his apprenticeship with me. Uh, he's 25. We work together or in some days we work in two separate vehicles. But And we've just took on another apprentice and then Jamie's just about to leave. He's going back to Spain. We've turned him into a farrier brain now. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to use his vet skills and, uh, you know, and he'll be back next year with us part-time. But we've got a few part-time qualifieds as well that come in. It's different days. On my vet clinic days, often... Either Lexi, who was a previous apprentice of mine, she comes in and helps, or another qualified guy. Awesome. So there's quite a few people involved at any one time. There's kind of four or five of us. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, if, as a North American where that practice isn't as common, the multifarrier idea, that's interesting. Must be difficult trying to keep track of who's coming when. and Yeah, it takes a bit of pre-planning. But we have, I have set days on certain yards so my vet days are Wednesdays usually. So I, I shoe at uh, Paul House Vets on a Wednesday. Often people who are taking exams, they want to come and spend the day with us or some farriers just come and hang out for the day and um, come and discuss cases or things like that. So, yeah, there's a lot of 
visitors as well in in the business so we have foreign visitors as well we always welcome um, people from the states or canada and i've had some australians this year swedish quite a lot from scandinavia come over you know on, on short trips well perfect that answers a question for me from later on if i could come along for a ride someday oh yeah sure you're, you're welcome anytime <laughs> yeah yeah that'd be incredible I can't guarantee that we'll be uh, undercover all the time, but you know we mostly get a roof on over our heads, but sometimes not. We're out in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, spoiled North Americans. So who were some of your other mentors? Early on, my early career, I was busy with family and family commitments. And I was, you know, again, building my business. I always had apprentices from quite early in my career. I think from when I was 29, I started 20, 28, 29, I, I had guys that worked for me. Yeah, I'd say strong influences were Richard Ellis, definitely. I spent a lot of good times with Richard. He became a good friend and still things that Richard taught me, that's still with me all the time now, you know. Grant Moon, I met Grant in probably 2007. He'd been out of the competition scene. Again, he's a Staffordshire Farrier. Um, we became good friends and I was an organiser. I wasn't a competitor back then in sort of uh, in my mid thirties, I started to pick up the tools and think, you know, we always made shoes. I never used to compete. We organised Staffordshire County show and I was always the guy that organised it, but I picked up the tools and started to compete and went from there. Grant asked me, said, Hey, you know, I'm going to make a comeback. Do you want to uh, compete with me and do some competitions together? So I thought, yeah, that'd be cool. So I took a lot of time to be with Grant. Any opportunities that I could grab to forge with Grant, I would go six in the morning or, you know, sometimes we'd forge late at night. I'd finish shoeing at seven and go to Grant's for a couple of hours, you know. Wow. Yeah, coaching from Grant and Richard, you know, that was a big part of my early um competition career and definitely towards my examinations as well mark watson again i've been fortunate to be with some great great people great forgers and uh, people with active minds you know and sort of inspired a lot of my thought from their teaching as well cool i i didn't know your association with grant moon that's great yeah yeah i was uh, on the team must have with grant 2010 calgary i was rookie of the year calgary 2010 that was my first year there and then uh 2011 i competed again at calgary and then I had a year off and then 2013 grant asked me if i'd like to go on a team with him jesper erickson and axel vibe from norway again they, those two guys they've taught me masses you know the scandinavians that i spent time with as well you know the axel and um jesper they're brilliant forgers so we were on team hella and we, we won, the, won the draft 2013, and I was top five in Calgary. Amazing. Didn't win, unfortunately, but <laughs> <laughs> but it was nice to be alongside those guys. You know, there was, like, there was Grant, Dave Verini, Stephen Bean, Matt Randalls, and little old me at the end of the line. <laughs> wow. Now, how did you maintain a balance with your work at home? Is that where having the multifarrier practice came into play? Yeah, I've always had good people around me as to help me as well, you know, and that was really important. On my journey, I guess, from 2007, 2008, I was kind of inspired a little bit by an apprentice that I had with me at the time, Billy McQueen, to pick up the tools because I thought, well, if I can't even fuller and show this apprentice how to fuller, I'm not much of a teacher, you know. So I guess that, that was where I started to pick up the tools. And then Grant said to me, you know, you should think about your associate. Yeah, but I always had good guys around me to help me as well. You know, that's really important because I, sometimes with the clinics and courses that I was attending and then traveling quite a lot with competition, you know, I competed a lot in the UK as well. Um, probably from 2009 to 2014, I was competing everywhere I could, everything I could afford, really, but it was expensive. Oh, wow. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> and when you're competing, you're not working, so. Yeah, that's it, yeah. And you kind of, end up squeezing in a lot of shoeing in between, you know, two or three days away at a competition in the midweek and then I'd work weekends and we've always had a hard work ethic, at, you know, I'll work seven days if I have to, yep. to work around competitions. So often it involves Sundays, late night practices or early morning practices. And again, great teachers kind of help you along with that, you know, and tell you, say, right, well, you're not going to fit this all in if you don't 
get out of bed early and get in the forge or get in the books early in the morning, you know? Right. It doesn't sound like you're the kind of person who sleeps very much. No. <laughs> but I can I can function on about five hours. Yeah. Yeah. But when I'm, I'm traveling, that's probably an advantage when I'm, I, you know, I've done it to do a lot of clinics now for for workmen and um, traveling a lot with them this year. And also doing some judging abroad. I judged in Australia this year, which was good fun. Um, judged okay. the Gatton Heavy Horse World Championship, they call it. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of traveling and sort of light sleep. <laughs> but, uh, if I'm traveling at a weekend, uh, I went to Cornell a few weeks ago, flew on a Friday, two days lectures and uh, demos and then flew back on the monday and then straight to work as soon as i got back wow busy busy <laughs> it's good fun <laughs> i can't say no that's it i'm having to figure out how to say no to some things but it's uh it's luckily it all just sometimes it all piles up together you know and even now you know i've got good guys in my business that are helping me um do the things that i'm able to do as well right now you st- started the process for the aw what was that like for you what did you have to do what were some of the routines you had to embrace to make that happen again the, the early inspiration for that was i i was started to compete and after some early successes i started to think what can i do with the, the skills that i'm learning here you know because competition's a great way of elevating your skills quickly you know, and I found that, you know, I was, because I was competing so much, my range of skills, forging skills were increasing. It's a steep learning curve. For me, that was that was a great part. But then I thought, well, what can I actually do with this that's going to be more beneficial to my long-term career? So then taking the advice of Grant, I, um, I put in for my associate. And now once said you could take the option of splitting the, um, the examination and the worship company allow associates, candidates to take their practical separate to their theory if, if they want to. So I thought, well, because I was busy in my business and still competing as well, and um, I put in for my practical first, and I thought I'll take care of the theoretical after that, you know, but getting in the right. books is hard for me. Okay. I'm not an academic. That was the tough bit. So, uh, yeah, but the early days was, um, it was quite easy to incorporate those, you know, those skills. And again, I went, Mark Watson was a big help for me, both associate and fellowship. He's Farrier Sergeant Major at uh, Melton Mowbray. So that's where the exam, higher examinations for the worship of a company take place at uh, the Army Barracks at Melton Mowbray. So um, Mark helped me a lot as well. Yeah, early days. And Richard, again, and Grant, you know, he was like, get your specimens made, you know, three months before you take your exam, get all your AW specimens made. And it's good to have other people putting that pressure on you as well. Sometimes if it's a single a single journey, you know, and you've not got mentors that are coaching you, helping you, you kind of rest rest a little bit. I had a 12-month plan from the decision to take my practical to then the theoretical after that. Oh, wow. It does help to be accountable to somebody else, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I find now... I'm approached by some guys now to be mentors, you know, or help them towards doing their associate. Um, I teach on the BFBA associate courses. Um, that's a great thing, you know, the associate courses that, that are organised now by the British Farriers and Blacksmiths Association at Stonely. Yeah? They really help them along because they go one day a month and different clinicians go in each month and they do half day theoretical and half day practical. Because I think, you're so reliant on tutoring sometimes, you know, to, to actually go out and find the information. It's hard. It's not difficult nowadays, you know, with the amount of online tutoring and uh, online learning that we can, we, it's available. But uh, it's hard for us to get in the books with being a hands-on yeah, practical sure. guys, I think, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. It's probably the main extent of us. So what books did you focus on to study for it? Uh, for my associate, all the volumes of Simon Curtis, Corrective Farrowy, Volta Racehorse, I found those really useful in conjunction with Adam's Blameless in Horses as well. Okay. I used I used a lot of tablet platforms like uh, 3D Horse, uh, Hoof Explorer, and there's some really great Horse Anatomy 3D, I think there's one other one. Yeah, so as even now I use, I use them quite a lot for 
anatomy explanation to students as well and uh, building presentations from that. But I found I need to be visual in my learning as well. So I've that incorporated that into my revision plan. And again, Mark Watson's got a you know structure in your revision. You know, I went, I started on diploma. So I went back over all my diploma notes and I did kind of two months diploma and then started to go more in depth into Adams because you can't just pick up Adams Lameness in Horses and read it that easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. It's not a light read. I fell asleep in it a few times, but it, it's a reference book. So kind of prompt with revision exercises and, you know, I had a revision book. I'd use revision cards. And so I went through different aspects you know, I'd do osteology and try and review all the all the things that I knew before and try and build on those in more in depth then. Yeah, I, I know quite a few people in the process of doing some testing here. Uh, I have known quite a few people who've used cue cards as a means of memorizing and then testing themselves. Yeah, yeah. There's something about that process that really embeds it in your brain. Yeah, and I found a, a revision book quite useful. So I'd I'd kind of strip down, I'd read a chapter in Simon Curtis's book and then I'd I'd bullet point key points that I thought were relevant, you know, growth plate closure times and all that kind of thing. And I tried to build that into a revision book. Okay, yeah. cool. And then you've got a reference afterwards. Yeah, yeah. My revision was uh, a little bit broken. It wasn't, I w- it wasn't as effective. Uh, again, I think self-tutoring is the same as kind of forging on your own isn't it you know it helps if you're in groups and helps if you can get into a revision group or have a mentor that's firing questions at you definitely and that helps you know having revision questions associate papers and uh, i'd get up early in the morning and again that's advice from mentors mark watson was was one of those he said like six in the morning get in the books for an hour before you go to work and then you'll think about you think about the things that you've revised in the morning. Yeah. And it helps you're working on the animal during the day. And that stuff, I think, becomes even more ingrained because you can then, hands on, you kind of apply some of those things, right? Yeah, definitely. Evening revision just uh, doesn't stay in my uh, in my brain. It kind of just, uh, it disappears by the next morning. But uh, morning revision has been very helpful. Um, has it? Okay. Well, and then, so after passing your AW, how long did you wait or how long did the preparation process take to do the FW? I guess uh, 2012, Sandy Beveridge approached me and said, we'd like you to join the examination group and be an examiner for the Worship of Company of Farriers. He said, the only thing you will have to sit your fellowship, you know, or a module of your fellowship, you know, within the first 12 months of being a probationary examiner and I said well Sandy I'm I'm fully intending on doing that anyway so I suppose immediately after I was it was active in my mind to do it and then probably being asked to join the worship company farriers as an examiner was also a kick up the backside for me as well <laughs> yeah a little bit more encouragement yeah and I, and it was always a goal and sometimes it was it was a it seemed a far away goal and then 2012, 13, I was competing. 14, I started to think about subjects and things that things that I wanted to concentrate on. So I guess 2014 was when I started, and then I completed the final part in 2017. But again, um, Mark Watson and Mark Trussler, they're both also examiners. We forged together every month, either at my forge or or at one of theirs, and we gave ourselves set piece we had a communication like in a group and then we'd say right we're going to do fishtails we'd either ask someone's advice about how best way of going about making fishtails or pattern bars and each month we gave ourselves a task practical task and i was just saying to mark the other day how how helpful that was because it was kind of a practical tutor group as well you know and we sometimes grant would pop in and give us some help and advice as well but it was, yeah, massively helpful to forge together. And we'd watch each other a lot, you know, on, on advice from Grant. We wouldn't just forge separately. We'd say if we're making a fishtail, Mark Watson's got all, all kinds of uh, neat tricks and gadgets that he puts in an anvil, you know, like jigs and 
things like that. So he, he came up with the lots of ideas and ways of making pattern bars easier because we didn't know what we would get as a practical task because the um, examinations group, the executive group had changed the practical task for the uh, fellowship then. Instead of it being a shod, cadaver, sandy beverage initiated practical changes. So we shod, he shod live horse in the fellowship, which it was great for us, you know, because that was is a real good test then. So the, the fellowship exam was practical and it, it was led by the candidate as to you prescribed what you, you know, what shoe you felt was necessary for that horse. You were given a, a scenario, a horse with specific problems advised by the examiners. So we were the first three to take the new exam practical, myself, Mark Watson and Mark Trussler. So once you've got that part under your belt, then concentrated on the, on the uh, dissertation and the hard work bit again i left till the last which was probably the wrong way of doing it but <laughs> <laughs> and for people who don't know about that what is involved with the dissertation you're expected to contribute let's say five thousand word dissertation on a subject which is relative to farrowy which may help farrowy in the future or be it doesn't have to be a new concept it doesn't have to be a new idea you can rework previous pilot studies you could do a further study into something that's previously been done so um yeah that's the hardest thing is to find a subject that you actually think you can study and bring into your business as well you know my first idea was was a something that i'd noted about heel deformation um like a vertical line or a ridge we call it a heel flare you might be familiar with heel flares and i was studying vertical ridges in the heels because I felt it got a link to abnormality of um, either a deformation of the heel or under one heel or heels that were um, contracted. I saw the difficult thing for me was was trying to do that on live horses in my business and gather reliable data, you know. So a few yeah. times I gave up because the horses kind of get agitated if you take two hours to shoe, <laughs> shoe a horse, you know. And measuring heels, I was measuring heels and writing down a lot of data trying to gather information on at least 10 horses that were in my business at the time and then sometimes yeah one got laminitis so that had to be taken out of the study and oh, right. uh, and I was up and down I was up and down with subjects again Sandy Beverage was a was a mentor for fellowship again Grant came to the rescue and one day I was like oh, Grant I don't think I'm ever going to get this done you know this was uh, 2016 I think 2015-16 and um, Grant said oh, oh I'm doing a study at RVC so you can hop on with this I need a foot trimmer so he said um, we CT'd 100 cadaver limbs and he wanted a foot trimmer for his study for fellowship Renato Weller said you can pull out whatever data you need from the images and so think of something oh wow yeah so that kind of unexpectedly saved me and again Grant was a big inspiration for that you know um, we worked together at RVC on that project. Again, long hours, a lot of trimming. I think we trimmed a hundred, hundred <laughs> cadavers in a in a night. Oh wow! I don't like trimming dead feet, but it was uh, it had to be done. Yeah. <laughs> but for the study, Grant wanted a consistent, experienced farrier to do the foot trim. Okay. Yeah. His study was on foot mapping. He's just achieved his fellowship actually now. This time, he's just sat his uh, his theoretical, but. You submit your dissertation when that's accepted, then you can go forward to your theoretical part of the exam, which is 20 minute lecture on your subject and then a 20 minute surprise lecture. You have an hour to prep a surprise lecture. Wow. So yeah, it's a tough one. What you have to start to prepare uh, a bank of lectures, you know, so your laminitis lectures, or, you know, tendons, ligaments, lower limb injuries or lectures on foot balance so i'd got i'd got a fairly good um bank of lectures already done before the exam okay but, yeah that's how you'd prepare for that yeah an hour to prepare a 20 minute lecture it doesn't have to be powerpoint you can do it flip chart or whiteboard if you want can okay, we all need props so then yeah you submit a shoe board as well for your fellowship okay and what's on the shoe board a minimum of eight shoes and mainly welded shoes and shoes of more advanced 
remedial shoes. So fishtails, pattern bars, aluminium welded shoes. What was on mine? Yeah, there was fishtail, pattern bar, aluminium bar shoes, deep seated straight bars. Yeah, so it can be your choice what shoes you submit for fellowship. Okay. And what was your dissertation on? What did you eventually settle on? The title was um, A Study into the Apical Angle of P3 and its relationship to the dorsal wall to weight bearing surface. So I've always been interested in orientation and shape of P3. And with the invitation of the CT imagery, it was a reliable way of measuring bone angle. So Renata, again, helped massively. She said, look, John, I know what your mind's like. You know, you've got to narrow down your subject. It's got to be tight. You've got to find something that's not going to fit, fill up. You know, 5,000 words it sounds a lot, but it goes. You know, you, my first edit was over 6,500 words, I think. <laughs> edit time. Yeah. So she got me to narrow down my subject. And I said, well, oh, I'm really interested in the bone angle and its variance. So the, the apex bone angle. So we come up with the, uh, the terminology of apical angle. So an apical angle is used in medical terminology and also horticulture. So the apex of a root meristem, we would call it the apical meristem. So we thought we could use the word apical. It's a, a measurement of a pyramidal apex. Right. It doesn't necessarily have to be an apex facing upwards because apical can relate to the tip of an apex. So we measured the apical angle of P3 and compared it to the dorsal wall to weight bearing surface before and after trimming in the fronts and hinds okay. of the cadaver limbs. So we had a technician to obviously a skilled technician who could do a sagittal cut with CT on the images. Um, we had to use markers in a way of creating a um, false ground surface. We actually use wooden tongue depressors because obviously on CT image, the hoof, we had to have a marker for the ground bearing surface of the of the hoof wall. So, oh, okay, yeah. But it was fascinating. It was great to work, to work at RVC with, with Renata and Grant. You know, Renata's undoubtedly a leading expert on, on certainly hooves and statistics and conducting um, scientific uh, testing she was brilliant you know and again things that it taught me like um protocols you know creating a lab book write down your questions you know exactly what you want to answer in your study so at the very beginning she said that renata said the first thing you need to do is what do i want to ask what do i want to answer what do i want to investigate and you know, clearly set down what your parameters are and how you're going to go about conducting the study. And, you know, I'd advise that for anyone, really, because academic teaching, we're not fortunate to have that in, in most of our um, our careers, you know. we're not. I, I wasn't linked to a university at the time. So to have a university teaching and, and mentoring in that way, you know, where you clearly identify what your task is, how you're going to do it, you know, lab book. Yeah, it's a... A very different way of thinking. Yeah. And I think I structured that into my daily work a lot more, you know, record keeping. And if I'm going to conduct a study or if I'm shoeing a horse under examination with a vet, you know, I'll make sure at the very beginning I take pictures and I've got a massive inventory of pictures over the years, gathering information like that, you know, and keeping records. And I've got like 25,000 pictures. Oh, wow. Something like that of horses' feet. You know, it's great, great to have that. How many times do we uh, start shoeing a horse and halfway through think, ah, oh, I wish I'd have taken a photo at the beginning. <laughs> now, I guess if you make it part of your routine, it's a lot easier. You probably do it without thinking now. Yeah, yeah. 20, yeah. 25,000. Now, what kind of a platform would you use to store that so that you can easily access the information? Do you just use your phone? Or yeah, just, just uh, cloud storage. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I try and file things, you know, so I've got all my CT imagery I've got it under files, headings, and try and put things into into files. You know, nice feet, bad feet. <laughs> yeah. So when I'm starting to build presentations, but certainly that's something my fellowship, probably the fellowship study taught me is to try and get things into some sort of order. Because when you start writing and you start pulling out information, referencing, you know, to have some sort of filing system or 
be able to find your references or pictures very easily. You know, it was really important. But basically, we measured the angle of P3 in the fronts and hinds and compared it before and after trimming. So, you know, we had a, again, we had a lot of imagery, a lot of CT imagery as well, which um, my MacBook was, was, uh, we went very slow for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> CT images are big files. Are they? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah, it's fascinating. It was a, a really important part of my journey. I learned a great deal from uh, from Renata and Grant. Again, we submitted, uh, I think it was 5,500 I went over, but accepted within normal amount of words. They were happy okay. with 5,500, yeah. yeah. Okay. From what you found in that study, what sort of conclusions did you draw? Or has that changed the way you approach feet now? We supported previous studies into palmer angle, plantar angle, angles being steeper in the hinds. What we did find was the angle of variance in the hind feet. It was a random pull of horses. There was ponies, there was larger feet, there were small feet. So we couldn't identify the, the source, but they were mostly local horses from, uh, from the area that had, that had been euthanized for reasons not for the study. Okay. Sometimes um, the disposal of horses obviously have a large amount of cadaver material that go in for research. But we did find that the angle of variance in the hind pedal bone was greater, you know, plus or minus like 20 degrees variance, you know. Holy. So there was, a, there was a huge variance of angles. We supported previous studies, so we could say Palmer angle, three to five degrees. But what we did start to work out was if I added the mean Palmer angle, which was four degrees, and this again for further study, and uh, in addition to the apical angle, there was a strong correlation to the dorsal wall to weight bearing surface angle. So it's my belief as a farrier that foot shape and morphology strongly follows bone angle and shape. So that was one of the questions I wanted to answer was how closely does the foot mirror the angle and shape of the pedal bone. Right. So I think there's still a lot more to do with that. You know, I, I probably at some point in, in my career should do further study into that. But as a whole, most of the vets that I've talked to in my career prior to that study, no one measured the the apex angle of the pedal bone, as far as I'm aware. Some people read my dissertation and said, yeah, but it's an Im radiographic imagery. Taking an angle measurement off of a radiograph isn't, accurate and my answer to that is well okay well you take palmer angle measurement plantar yeah. angle measurement right. so why wouldn't the apical angle be relative you know but sometimes in the high low horses i've started measuring now at the vet clinic explaining to owners you know you've got two different angles here you know and the bone angle is different in the two front feet so it's, oh, really? it's okay. safe to assume that that you're not going to achieve the same hoof wall angle to weight bearing surface if if there's a bone angle difference as long as the orientation of the pedal bone is where you'd expect it to be right like in line with the the hpa and yeah and as long as yeah if there's no palmer descent or reverse pitch of right. of p3 okay. but yeah I, i've st I started using the measurement of the uh, apical angle yeah in my work but not strongly going to use it as a right we've got to have this horse at 55 degrees I don't set my angles, but it, it's interesting to view a pair of front feet and measure the bone angle and, and say, hey, you know, there's three de three degrees difference or sometimes more. So the thought process that came from that, it, it was a small-ish study, but we had masses of data. And still now, the, there's been further studies done from the CT imagery, J. Tovey. There's a couple of other guys, RBC, that have used the CT imagery that we did in that study, you know, so it's been a great contributor to other people's um, work as well. So all your trimming helped a lot of other people too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was worth all the hard work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah especially <laughs> Trim, for them. Trimming into the night. Yeah. Right. It was a tough few days because we knew, we, we knew we got to do it there and then, you know, we'd got to image the feet prior to trimming and then trim them and then get them back in the, in the scanner the next day. So it had to right. be done throughout the night, you know, and uh, Sean Millard, the research student that we worked with, he got a study from it as well, related to foot mapping 
and external reference points alongside with Grant. So Sean got his research project, Grant got his, I got mine, and there was another, Jay Tovey used the imagery. I think there's a couple of other people who've used the images as well. So it's very expensive CT. It would have cost tens of thousands for us to had to have funded it ourselves, you know. So it was great to hop on a research project with with others. And that's I think that's the great thing now we have is these collaborative studies with universities. I would say for anyone thinking of embarking on on that, um, it's definitely definitely look worth looking into um, collaborative study or linked to a university and um, alongside. That was going to be my next question. How do you fund something like that? You would just approach, or I guess maybe Grant did this, approach the university and say, hey, I want to do this particular study. Is this something you'd be interested in? And Yeah, I think just go from there. Grant gets what he wants, usually. <laughs> <laughs> he is an intimidating man. He has a man. persuasive manner. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He and Renato had worked together quite closely, and the same as myself, he'd got the uh, the fellowship was his long term goal. I think Renato said, "Grant, you know, you need to you need to do this." And with her persuasive personality as well, they're two very powerful people together, you know. And um, it was great to work with them. RVC are now doing courses, um, the uh, equine biomechanics degree course, which is, that's a real worthwhile thing. And the guys that I know that have done that, you know, they've, they're coming out of it with the knowledge and the, and the ability to, uh, to fulfill their fellowship then from, uh, from doing the, the RVC course. So I think, I think more universities probably will and should do those kind of graduate courses um, for farriers. I think it's, it's a great, opportunity and there's been a large amount of fellows now going forward for exam and I think it is probably the experience and the knowledge and the ability of having that opportunity to work with the universities and conduct studies in that way you know it's made it yeah not easier but it's made it uh, more accessible yeah it's pretty exciting times yeah great I mean it, yeah the uh, the information highway is kind of broadening all the time isn't it you know and um, it's great to have been a part of that no kidding in its infancy, really, I think. Now, when I met you, you had done a clinic for us at the Ontario Farriers Association with Workmen. How did you end up getting involved with them, and, and what does that involve? How many clinics do you do? I've met Ryan a couple of times. Ryan had phoned me in in 2014 and said, hey, you know, we, we, uh, we'd like you to do some clinics and work alongside us, and, you know, maybe we could work together. And again, the Workman family, they're inspirational, you know, they have a lot of energy, you know. Workman has a great work ethic, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited by that. But again, I said to Ryan, look, Ryan, you know, I'm in the middle of my fellowship. I don't think I can do it right now. Um, it's going to take me a couple of years. But And he said, oh, well, just give me a call when you feel you can do it. And then he, we spoke a couple of times and, and then uh, I started doing some doing some clinics early days with Ryan and uh, and then an opportunity to travel and, and become involved uh, as a clinician. Yeah. So uh, I have big respect for the, for the company. I think the brand is growing, you know, the awareness of the, the quality of the products that they make. Again, it was quite a small company, family run within the Netherlands. And then when Crystal and Ryan took over the company hero their dad is still he's still involved but he's handed over the uh the main running of the company to his children they've really put it out there you know and uh early days when i was traveling in scandinavia i coached the norwegian farriers team from uh, was it from probably 11 12 13 so for three years i was i was going out to norway a lot and i saw the shoes there and we we didn't have a, a big range of workman shoes in, in the UK. And again, that's that's growing now, the awareness of the brand. Um, you know, So went from there. And then I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world and represent workmen. You know, and it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, and again, they've, they're pioneering in in terms of research. You know, they work closely with Jenny Hagen, uh, Leipzig University. Uh, they have a lot of research projects on the go. They worked with Afigos with the Hoof Explorer app. Yeah, so again, apps and um, tablet ways of 
studying from a tablet, you know, is I think I think is a is certainly a, a good way forward for a lot of us as visual learners, you know. So Yeah, for uh, sure. Workmen have uh, they've got a lot a lot of things going on in a lot of different areas, you know, and um, and it's not a huge company but worldwide the 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 brand awareness is growing and uh, mm-hmm. it's it's great to be a part of that, you know. Yes, for sure. I'm learning as as I go as well. You know, I'm still learning every day, and from clinics, I get a lot from the clinics. You know, personally as well. Yeah, there's something about what sometimes people will ask you a question. So it'll be about something that you do all the time, but never really thought of in that way. And yeah, it just forces yeah. you to stop and vocalize what it is. Yeah, and no, I, th- I think when you start to break things down and tutor or teach or coach and then you you kind of you analyze a lot more you self-analyze you know i'm fairly self-analytical anyway i'm i'm pretty hard on myself day to day um, i think that's pretty common yeah amongst us <laughs> yeah um but also you you know you try to support the things that you're going to discuss in the clinic you know you can't really talk about personal theories without supporting evidence so right Yep. A lot of my presentations, you know, I, I spend quite a lot of time and effort looking into references, you know, a reference people that are relative to the subject, you know. Mm-hmm. I give credit to people who, who are reference and, and I use that. And again, that probably the background of um, research and referencing, you know, has helped, helped me again with the, with the presentations. Yeah, for sure. Now, uh, one of the topics that you covered during that conference was about the loss of the digital cushion, which is something I think we all kind of run into. One of the things you had pointed out is just even when you squeeze that area in between the heel bulbs, you can actually feel the loss on those low underrun heeled horses. Yeah. And yeah. Then you were using heart bars to help with that. And you had found that it actually maybe regenerated a bit or, or helped get it back early days i think the use of the heart bar bernie chapman was instrumental in making us aware of the many uses of the heart bar shoe early days in my career as an apprentice you know and as a newly qualified i'd I'd seen the use of the heart bar and it was always a bit of a, a shoe that we it was hard to master for novice so early in your career i think i think you don't use that many heart bars but (laughs) <laughs> yep because you couldn't make them um but obviously then you know access to orthotics and things like that yeah I, I started to use the heart bar but i found the heart bar on its own was a little too aggressive on some feet so i used i used it in conjunction with a pad but interestingly i think Stephen o'grady uh, and jay tovey have have pointed this out jay tovey his dissertation for his fellowship was the volume of the digital cushion, its, it's variance in the studied feet. And again, he used the cadaver material that we did uh, at RVC. So he, he used uh, the same cadaver material and measured measured the volumes of digital cushion and the differing volumes. Now, the common belief is that the, the digital cushion can't regenerate, but I, I do think we can activate it maybe not to regenerate, but we can activate the frog and digital cushion to certainly be more effective in blood supply. Okay. But early days with the heart bar and the use of the heart bar, and again, sometimes uh, we learn by by our mistakes, but you, you have to be very careful and proficient how you fit a heart bar and you know not to put too much pressure. But I was finding that I was getting frog atrophy so it had a good effect initially, sharing the load from the heels, you know, and I think it did activate blood supply within the digital cushion and the inner plexus probably are, are more activated. But again, you've got to be careful with horses with active side bone. If you're going to put a lot of pressure on the frog, you know, this is why sometimes without supporting x-rays, you know, when we've put a bar shoe on sometimes and it doesn't have a good effect, that's, I think that's, really important to consider that you know if you're going to activate the frog and digital cushion you know you need to you need to be aware that that horses with a ossification of the collateral cartilages are not going to like a lot of frog pressure because it would 
constantly push the heels and the the foot outwards, right? And put pressure on that. Is that why? I think so. Yeah. 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 And in my experience, that's, that's been evident, but sometimes we have horses cases like that where we've got active side bone, but also collapsed heels or counter rotation. And we want to try and give frog support. So I've moved a little away from the heart bars themselves and I started putting leather pads on a lot of horses okay. that we we had into the vet clinic. So I, I was, and I'd use pat, um, a leather pad with magic cushion and I was getting okay. a lot better frog growth when I had a soft junction between the heart bar and the shoe. Again, working with Ryan and I talked to Ryan about this, you know, Hey Ryan, you know, there's no, there's no leather pad with a frog support and I really want to make one. And, and Ryan said, yeah, we can do that. So uh, <laughs> we got the tools and started making a prototype leather pad and then sent it to um, Diplano. So Luigi Diplano in Italy to try and come up with a, with a prototype leather pad with a frog support. So we've experimented in the last two years with different, different concepts of uh leather pads with frog support you know um, but they're difficult to manufacture and not not be expensive in the process of manufacture because we've riveted we've glued we've stitched and eventually um luigi had, was already making the um, fusion f- pad with the rubber and the leather the, yeah so then yeah. um i said well just put a frog support in the fusion pad and that'll be the that'll be what we'll use and it's I'm using a lot of them for rehab. Um, I'm finding them very effective because okay. it's a soft support. You know, it's not too aggressive on the frog. Sometimes the um, horses appreciate that extra support, but without pressure. So, you know, the frog's got some relief as well. And the cushioning, you know, we've uh, we've done some testing on the pads with a meter to test how much uh, vibration they'll absorb, you know. So leather... Leather's really, really good at, at dissipating and absorbing vibration and concussion because it's natural fibers. Right, as opposed to the rubber. So plastic on its own. So hard plastic pads, they're like a tabletop. There's not much. Uh, we used a, a Lieb hardness tester on some pads and um, some of the effective pads that are quite hard, they don't actually take a lot of shock. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Away from the, the impact. So this is where I think the uh, leather and leather and rubber combination with the uh, with the Diplano pads has been really good. Uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a real good product, and I'm using it in the in a lot of the horses that I shoe uh, at a vet clinic as part of their rehab program. You know, in in pads. Oh, cool! Are those available now in North America? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're shipping worldwide. At Diplano, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. We, um, I will look out for those. Yeah, Diplano. Fusion frog support. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, di- I distribute them in the UK. Uh, but I'll, yeah, I'll send you some. <laughs> you can try them. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. Now another thing that came up in that clinic, uh, I think it was in the initial stages at that point was the black system. Could you explain that for those who don't know what that is? The Workman Black is a, it uses motion sensor technology. So very very small sensors using. Um, accelerometers and gyroscopes you know they fix onto the hoof with velcro really lightweight easy to apply and uh, they tracks the motion and movement of of the hoof so it can measure landings timings break over uh, hoof angle uh, stride length and footfalls and there's some cool additions that are coming quite soon as well at the moment front feet but you can you can bet that hind feet are going to follow, and also some app technologies that the updates are going to you know go more in depth into footfalls as well and uh, uh, movement of the hoof in mid stance. You know that's there's going to be some uh, some pretty nice uh, nice information that we can get from that. No kidding. Now you've used this. Has it changed anything for you shoeing wise? Like I imagine it has, but. What are some of the things that it is? Yeah, I, I, I was testing. I've been testing for two years uh, with the system now. Yeah, early days, it took a little bit of figuring out some of the some of the things that you expected to happen didn't didn't necessarily. We assume with our farrier 
minds if we set that brake over we're going to speed up or accelerate brake over but sometimes that the way that the system measures it actually initiates brake over sooner so the way that it's, it's reinforced some ideas in my mind certainly on footfall as a lameness clinician I work closely with a pool house vets we do a, a lameness clinic every Wednesday at the vets and you will know, we'll have anything from five to ten horses a week there a lot of them following MRI diagnosis so I use black at the vet clinic as well so certainly in my experience I have footfall has been really important for me you know and dynamic assessment has been a big part of my work ethic I try and look at horses walk and trot as much as I can ridden if possible as well before black um footfalls were a big part of that you know um, again learning from other great people and taking taking information from teachers that have showed me things you know and certainly to try and reduce the symptoms of lameness you know uneven footfall certainly for us in the UK you know we've got horses working on hard surface you know tarmac roads you know concussion concussion and concussive injuries can can have a an impact so so lateral medial footfall that's uh, or heel first whichever way but certainly black can show us in timings you know exactly in milliseconds how long it takes for the foot to from the first point of contact to fully loaded so in that respect it's definitely reinforced in my mind i think i'm doing the right thing you know so i've thought right this horse is landing heavy lateral heel and it's taking 35 milliseconds to land and load going to mid stance if we reduce those those landing times usually we can reduce the symptoms of lameness as well because a lot of those injuries have been impact injuries oh, okay so again using using workman black with mri diagnostics as well so i see i see a lot of collateral ligament injuries i'd say ddft you know deep flexor longitudinal tears are quite common now on mri diagnostics you know prior to that when horses were being diagnosed with navicular syndromes, when they had deep tissue tears, you know. Um, right. So I'm very fortunate in that using the technology that I have available to me as well and, and the imagery that, that I can use, yeah. Yeah, we're having big successes with it. And um, Workman Black's been uh, an important tool in the box, I think. And, and, and the amount of research that's going to come from that is... Uh, it's massive you know the, the the impact that it's going to have on it's not going to be one of these gate analysis devices that comes and goes mm -hmm. it's it's affordable it's very user friendly it's farrier based it's the technology now you know they're using this sense motion sensor technology and so many things that we see in human podiatry as well you know it's a big part of that i think motion sensors for some of us are going to you know it's going to be really helpful big game changer yeah yeah, I guess as the technology got smaller, that was when it actually finally became applicable. Because before, I think the hindrance was it was just so heavy that it would actually change footfall. And yeah, yeah, even in the early days, you know, the first the first test kit that I, that I trialed for for Workman, the sensors were fixed with a strap, but the uh, the designers knew that that couldn't be the production model. Had to be different slimline sensor very much less bulky than the first one and it fixes on with velcro and it's very really really lightweight so i can you can be sure that it, it doesn't inhibit the movement of the horse yeah exactly cool. but yeah and uh, even in the last so as soon as i saw the um, production model of black and crystal said we'd like you to take this one take this suitcase and and use it and i'm like wow oh, yeah this, this is going to be brilliant for foals and you know the Measuring horses at speed on different surfaces as well is going to be it's going to be a game changer. Mm -hmm. We can lead from that into the other topic of yet another project you're involved in, and that's your tool line. Yeah, yeah. I saw the the knife that you gave Doctor Andrea. It's one of the most beautiful knives I've ever seen. Oh, thanks. Yeah, but you have a, a whole line of tools. Yeah, again, I can thank Richard Ellis really for my inspiration in tool making because he was um he was the first person to uh to really sort of make me start to think 
when I was going doing clinics with Richard, I was like, yeah, I can't find a hammer that suits me. And uh, he said, yeah, well, come down, we'll make one. And um, <laughs> so he taught me and Josh how to make forging hammers. And so the initial, I still got the first hammer I made with Richard, you know, and I still use it. It's a beautiful hammer. And that was my inspiration to to start to make hammers, firstly for, for ourselves, you know, because we couldn't quite find that balance or that hammer that suited us. So uh, we started making hammers for ourselves and then a few friends and, and then it grew from there. You know, Josh is a, a brilliant guy to work with. He's got so many ideas. You know, my son, he's amazing on the sledgehammer. You know, so to make uh, to make tools with uh, with Josh, it's been it's been great, and we've had a lot of fun. Then we started to make nailing hammers. Unfortunately, Richard passed uh, in 2012, and I never got to spend that as much time with him as uh, as I liked. You know, he uh, yeah. he used to make amazing, brilliant nailing hammers as well. I always said to Richard. Rich, I, I want to make a nailing hammer out of Damascus. Me and Josh made uh, some Damascus nailing hammers, and you know, with uh, the nailing hammers, not so much we're not so much time for making the handmade hammers now. But um, Jim Blurton asked me and Josh if we had um, designed some tools and if he could design our um, hammer pattern for a tool range. So he's made some high quality tools, you know, on our our design. Right. I worked alongside Jim. Again, I'm really lucky to work with some great people, you know, and Jim, Jim's one of those, you know, he's, uh, he takes things from the concept to the, to the drawing board and he'll make a 3d model resin cast. And again, all the technology Jim will throw into it, you know, so 3d prints, 3d print scan, you know, he's, he scanned the hammer, 3d prints the, the resin model and then says, what do you think? You know, then you approve approve the resin model, and then it goes into production. So that must be exciting. Got a few ideas. We've still got some things we're working on with Jim. It takes a long time from the concept to then the drawing board. Jim said, "Design a knife." <laughs> what sort of knife do you want? He said, "Oh, something different. Just make it <laughs> make a knife." And so, uh, yeah, we got to it and made the knife handle, and it kind of looked a little bit like a horse's leg. So we put a shoe on the end of it. Uh, <laughs> yep. So you can use the the, uh, the tip of the knife for burning on instead of ruining your blade. Yeah, we exactly. use the washing. Yeah, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And Jim's Jim's a great great guy to work with. So he's he's got a lot of energy. Certainly uh, energized me and Josh with the, uh, you know, he wants uh, he wants more and more ideas and massive massive tool range. Like he makes so much, so many things. He he never switches off. I think he's another he's another insomniac. Yep. <laughs> like I said, I think it's pretty common. Yeah, well, I think we're just, we're just all in the same club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the other tools I haven't seen one myself was your nippers. They have a special rivet system, do they not? Yeah. Some years ago, I think uh, we'd seen the Breckenridge tongs and uh, a friend of mine had, had showed me a pair of box joint tongs that were handmade. And uh, me and Jim talked about this and looking at mole grips and you know like vice grips and things like that we said you know it would be great to make a joint in the nippers which was a box joint so jim took that to the design table and then we came up quite quickly with um with the box joint nippers you know which they're strong they're in and the tongs you know the forging tongs you know i can't go anywhere without my uh my forging tongs you know the box joint forging tongs do yeah they grip really really nicely you know really well Mm-hmm. And some of the things we thought we may have problems with them jamming or sticking with the nippers because it's such a tight joint, we thought the nippers might present problems when they got dirt inside, you know, but they've been good. They've been really effective. I still got my first pair from well, two years now. Wow. And when we, we launched the uh, the the nippers at, uh, at Cincinnati two years ago, yeah. Okay. And I imagine you probably get a lot less play over time still with them too because of that joint right yeah i'm finding that with with the ones i've got the number one pair a stamp with the number one prototype and um, <laughs> josh has still got his originals yeah so i think Incredible. what we don't always look at as far as you know we our tools need maintenance and yeah and abusing nippers throwing them kicking around on the floor and they get hard life and the nippers are a money maker they save us a lot of effort and good pair of nippers will 
will stand you in good stead. You know, they're, uh, they're the first part of a good trim, aren't they? Yeah. So my nippers are a really valuable part of my toolkit. I've always invested in in good tools myself. You know, I've always bought good quality tools and uh, and I maintain them, you know, keep oiling them. And sometimes I see guys that come in and work for me, you know, and they're kicking their nippers around on the floor or they're clenching tongs and, you know, looking after your kit, you know, it's it means a lot. It lasts longer and it works better for you as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. Well, I guess I sh- we should finish this portion with the, the usual questions. What would you tell somebody first getting started in this business? What advice would you have for them? Listen, listen to your mentors and take every bit of information you can. Don't wait for it to come to you and, and go out and look for it. Set the basics, get the basics right and everything will follow. You know, I'm a, I'm a really basic guy. I'm not complicated at all. <laughs> somebody actually came to me at a clinic uh, and he said, uh, John, you're really basic. And I said, oh, thanks. That's a real compliment. <laughs> and he said, no, no, you don't understand. Your job was basic. And and I said, well, that's surely the best form of treatment is if you keep it simple, you know. Yeah. Kiss method, keep it simple, stupid. But yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm basic. It's instilling those basics, principles, and you know, stick to your strong principles. Like in saying basic, it's still... That level is difficult to achieve. That's, I think, the misinterpretation of that, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, doing that basic, simple job is it takes a lot of time and adjustment and learning to get there. Yeah, and maintain it. Yeah, if you can exactly if you can reach it, then you've got to maintain it every day. So I find it easier if I can maintain a basic method every day than a complicated mm-hmm. method every day. So <laughs> I'm always trying to simplify everything you know in terms of rehab like i think rehabilitation you certainly in the horses that we shoe you know, try and find the simplest method to do something right now what about somebody who's five or ten years in think about your direction and where you want to go don't just keep doing what you always did and think that it's going to last forever you know because we've only we've all only got so many horses in us there's only so long our bodies will last and so you've got to think about the end game your window of opportunity to pursue your goals in midlife is not massive. The window closes, so you know, twenty-five to thirty-five, we're shooing hard, making money, and then your window's closing. You know, of trying to achieve those higher qualifications or betterment. You know, or, you know, reaching the goals and reaching the hopes and dreams that you wanted, always wanted in your career. You know. And uh, mm-hmm. I think be aware that that opportunity in the 10 years in is lessening, you know, and certainly go for it you know, and uh, take all the information that, that you can and when you can and maximize what you, what you can do in terms of knowledge. Cause it'll, it'll stand you in good stead. I think later in life. Yeah. Great advice. Well, I guess we'll go into the, the short answer questions. I thought those were. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. This portion of the podcast is called the Stratum Tectorium. These are the short answer, surface stuff questions. But it's okay if the guest wants to go deeper. Enjoy. Favorite book? It has to be Simon Curtis, uh, Corrective Farrowy. Okay. But there's one of three favorite books, but I can't, I can't really choose which one. Simon Curtis's books, yeah, definitely help me and sort of become my favorites, yeah. Okay. Your favorite brand of work boots? Redback. I don't think that's a brand available in North America. Why oh, isn't it? No, I don't think so. Mm, it's Australian. Australian, yeah, like a, like a pull-on, elasticated, no laces. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we have like Blundstones from there. That would probably be yeah red be bucks similar. yeah they're, oh, okay. they're um, real comfortable and again I think it's really important for us to look after our feet because we're carrying a lot of weight through our feet you know um, through horses no kidding so arch support is really really important for me if I don't have arch support in my in my work boots I I, I struggle with my back yeah my, I find the same thing knees and back suffer dearly because of it. I've often told people who work with me that 
you have to have a good pair of boots because it's really hard to tell a client that they need to pay good money for shoeing while you're wearing a cheap pair of shoes. Yeah, yeah. I think it's <laughs> yeah, I think it says a lot. I see guys with worn out boots, you know, my my boots, my work boots tend to wear out from the inside, you know, and I put in new insoles and things like that, but unless I tread on something hot and burn them, I usually find that they've gone inside before they've gone on the outside. Yeah, I think our feet do a lot of moving around to adjust for the weight and stuff. We don't really think about how much weight we're carrying through our feet when we're holding, <laughs> up, holding up horses, you know, as an effect. No kidding. Yep, for sure. What's your favorite make of Rasp? Uh, definitely Hella, XL Legend. Okay. Uh, what is your dream farrier rig? I've actually got it. It's a Ford Ranger with a N and J build on the back. So yeah, I guess uh, guess there. I have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one might be redundant. What's your favorite rounding hammer? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, my uh, my two pound J Nun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Well, actually, no. The, the handmade one that me and Josh made. Yeah. Yeah, you still that's... use that yeah. frequently? Yeah. yeah. Favorite type of bar stock to work with? I love concave, but again, my business has massively changed. I'm more away from concave. Oh, really? Yeah, we're putting way more flat. We're working on more and more horses that are working on surfaces like fiber sand surfaces. And so concave is real strong in, in the UK and we're all brought up with concave, you know? And so, yeah, I guess uh, 7838 concave, that's, that's my favorite section uh, and it's the most commonly used section okay. that we would use in our business we're moving very rapidly away from concave i'm probably 50 percent flat steel now on feet that's just due to the traction that the concave gives on the fiber footing yeah it, well, i think so too much. Yeah, yeah yeah it's just max maximum traction and it's yeah it's superb it's not it's late it's lightweight concave sections but um and again, this is this going back to Workman and when Ryan first asked me to get involved and, you know, we had a lot of discussions about the concave shoe market in the UK. And I said, well, do you know what? It's going to change. It's changing, massively changing. And most farriers that consider that and think about the horses and the footing that they're shoeing for, you know, they're, they're making those differences and the, the benefits are, are huge. You know, the, the reduction of um, impact injuries or, you know, certainly with the dressage horses that we shoe, yeah. Okay. Sadly, sadly less concave and more flat, but... Hmm. Gas or diesel truck? Diesel. Favorite pastime after work? Favorite pastime after work. Do you even have anything you do outside of work? <laughs> well, it depends if you call it making hammers. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying riding bikes at the moment. I've got a mountain bike and, uh, and a road bike. I'm not so much of a roadie anymore because, uh, you know... The roads are dangerous, so yeah, no kidding. We uh, we run a charity here called the Farriers Foundation, and uh, every year, handmade shoes, Billy Crothers and, and his team. We've organised a Tour de Farrier, so four <laughs> years now we call it Tour de Farrier. So um, that's awesome. That's a road bike charity, road bike um, for farriers and anyone who wants to get involved. So that's been fun. You know, we raised uh, we raised a lot of money for the for the charity with the with that. You know, so this year we're hoping to do it in the Malvern Hills, be on road bikes, and we'll we'll probably have a mountain bike um, version as well for those of us who, uh, who who like the bikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it definitely definitely it's good fun, and it. I was just sorting last night to 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 Jim Bell for about cycling, and so there's quite a few farriers who've got into cycling. You know, it's a good way of keeping fit and. Helping your lower body as well, yeah. Because we're a lot of upper body, and we don't really, you don't really look after our back. You know, my back's been definitely better since I started cycling. You know, um, yeah, it just strengthens your core. Yeah, I need to get back on the bike. Um, we were talking last night. When I'm into it, if it's a choice between forging or cycling, the bike wins. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know. It's a strange addiction, you know, but it it really gets gets hold of you. Yep. No, I understand. I, I used to mountain bike a lot around here. So the next thing on your bucket list, Tour de France. <laughs> <laughs> next thing on the bucket list. I've ticked off a few. Um, yeah, no kidding. You know, trips to Canada, going up the CN Tower. That was a, that was a bucket list. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yeah, the big trees, going to see in the Sequoia. Went there with Ryan last year. Yeah, we had a trip to uh, see the uh, Sequoia Forest. So the giant trees. 
Amazing. Uh, I guess Niagara Falls. You're yeah. going to have to come back here. Yeah, I'll come. That's great. A mountain bike uh, trip and uh, in Canada and see Niagara Falls. Perfect. Well, let me know when you're going to do that. Yeah, I should. I need to book some uh, leisure trips, not work trips. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> uh, your favorite brand of keg shoe? Well, I think we already know that, but your favorite model? Uh, Workman Warrior Special. Okay. And why the Warrior Special? Uh, it's got a breakover toe, uh, so it's got a real nice smooth breakover, three-quarter footed, and wide heels. Not yeah. They're not onion heels, but they just widen the heels. Right. Favorite type of horse to work on? My body's not liking the heavy horses, but I've enjoyed chewing heavy horses in the past. Yeah? Yeah, they're fun, but yeah. uh, my body <laughs> doesn't think so much nowadays. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think drafts, light drafts and drafts, yeah. Okay. Ideal number of horses to shoe all around in one day? Five. Okay. Your favorite anvil? The one that I use in my truck is uh, is a Baker American pattern. Uh, they don't make them anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a wide table, cut out, sort of slimline table. It's a nice anvil. It's stuck with me all these years. <laughs> From the <laughs> like start, it was one of my first purchases. Yeah. Uh, your favorite inspirational quote or a couple of them, if you have some, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> I tell myself that or get it hot. <laughs> yep. It's amazing how many times we have to be told that when we first start out and then, yeah, it does play in your head. Yeah. And that, and that yeah, that's one of the things that Richard showed me a lot, of, a lot of those things, you know, simple basics and just working hot steel. Yeah. What brand of accounting software do you use? Sage. Okay. And QuickBooks. Okay. You guys have that over there too. Yeah. App that has most improved your work life. Hoof Explorer. Your preferred social media platform. Facebook. I'm less on it than I have been in the past, but yeah, Facebook. Since my iPhone could tell me how much screen time I've been spending, I've yeah, it's definitely made an effort to uh, <laughs> reduce screen time. Yeah. Do you have injury insurance? Yes. Do you use invoicing software or like just written out forms? Uh, yeah, QuickBooks. Yeah, okay. we we uh, we're entirely electronic, so we use tablets for um, diary. So we use a shared a shared diary. So when we work the day and um, go to separate calls, and me and Josh can pre-book appointments, but every, everything's pre-booked, pretty right. much. Yeah. Now, what do you use for your calendar then? Like what uh, app or? Uh, just the um, just the tablet app, so iPad. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So it shares with the phone. So yeah. if I'm if I'm traveling, I can add things in the diary. So book Josh and other five horses in when he thinks he's going home at five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and for the North Americans, diary is agenda. A good friend of mine who works with me, he is from. Essex and he says diary all the time and we figured out what he meant by that. Ah, uh, diary, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Calendar. Yeah. 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 Your favorite method of soothing aches and pains. Josh bought me a like a mechanical uh, massage cushion. That's quite nice. Yeah. Use yeah. that on my sciatica. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a not, not a massage chair, but you know, soothing aches and pains with that. Yeah. Your favorite brand of jeans? Levi's. Okay. Favorite genre of music? Heavy metal rock. Really? Mm. Okay. Do you work out? Occasionally, but more cycling than gym. Right. Okay. Yeah. Do you meditate? Not knowingly. Okay. No. Well, yeah, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Get in the zone. Yeah. 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 Like in kind of in the flow when you're working and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And what would you have been if not a farrier? I was quite an artist at school, you know, so I, uh, a ceramic ceramic design was one of my subjects. Oh, really? Okay. That was one path that I was heading down as a 3D design, so not dissimilar. <laughs> so working with Jim probably appeases some of that too. Three-dimensional so. design, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I, I, was, I was a bit of a creative kid and um, uh, a potter and did stuff, a bit of drawing. I'm an artist, but could have been a, a 
a poor artist by now. Yeah, <laughs> a starving <laughs> artist, yeah. <laughs> and then is there anybody you would recommend that I should have on the podcast? Mark Watson. Okay. Yeah, Mark Watson, obviously Grant. Yeah, he's uh, he stays under the radar, Mark. He's he's inspired a lot of people to achieve. You know, and he's certainly certainly been a a great teacher for me and an inspiration. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'll look him up. Yeah. I might get his contact info off of you. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, you should. You should. He's uh, he's real helpful, and uh, he'll probably uh, be a good interviewee. Yeah. I'll get you to help him with all the tech stuff. <laughs> Well, I can take him the mic. We can just post it around when we need it. <laughs> That's perfect. That's great. And he's quite techy as well, so he'll be able to work it out quicker than me. I'm sure he'll find that yeah, the mute button on the side of it quicker than I could. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that's the end of the interview. Thank you so much for doing this. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. Oh, it's a pleasure. I enjoyed it's, it. It's been great.